question. Um, and just to introduce Carrie for those of you who don't know her, um, she is the co-chair of the provisional committee. So um, that's just one level above students and the RGD has different membership levels. And she's been doing an amazing job with that committee. Um, she's also a graphic designer with the Blondes, which is a studio out of Kitchener and a part-time um, instructor at Conestoga College. Um, and yeah, we're super excited to have her talk. She talked, she spoke to us last year as well. And uh, she was a favorite because she gave us so many great time management tips. So <laughs> we thought, what a great way to start off the year. Yeah. Um, scary. <laughs> start off on the right foot. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> okay you can see my screen you can hear me yep perfect all right so yeah so hello thank you for having me here today and yes as we we're talking uh my name is carrie and then my last name this shifts around either higgs or tully depending on what you're looking at but the carrie will not change <laughs> So like Rupta just said, I'm gonna share about my graphic design career thus far um, and my involvement with the RGD and I have some advice around time management. So how did I get here? So I'm a Conestoga grad um, and I completed my advanced diploma in graphic design there. Prior to that, I completed a bachelor of science in psychology and sociology from U of T. And I also did a certificate in publishing from Ryerson, which is, I guess, now University X. Um, and I only mention that because that's actually the reason why I got into design. Um, I took a book cover design class, like on a whim in my publishing program, and that led me here. So it's kind of crazy. Uh, and then during the third year of my graphic design program, we had a placement. So I was super lucky. I got a placement at a local studio in Kitchener called Studio Locale with Phil Mondor. And then after that, I was very, very lucky to be offered a job there at the end of my placement. So that's kind of where I got my start uh, working as a, a real designer. So I worked for Studio Locale for about a year and a half. It was a great experience. I really enjoyed the team there. Um, and then I had an opportunity come up through a friend of a friend who was looking for a designer with a background in psychology. So I was super curious about the idea of being able to combine my two loves of design and psychology. And I had never really considered like that they could actually work together, but of course they do. And I ended up being offered a job through this connection. Um, and I worked through, for that company for a little over a year. There were a lot of challenges. I was the first designer that they had on their team full time. So they had no knowledge really of what a designer does, what the design process is, any of that. So it was kind of interesting because I spent a lot of time educating the team um, about those things and also building the design department, which was just me, department of one. Um, <laughs> so that was really interesting. Um, and I, I did enjoy the, the teaching aspect of it, but unfortunately I did not enjoy some of the other challenges that I was having. So as those continued to grow, um, I made the decision to step away and do, do freelance for a little while. So I freelanced for probably a few weeks um, it wasn't long before another friend put me in touch with the creative director at the Blondes, Julie. So hard truth, uh, no job is perfect. This is actually a direct quote from my mom. And of course she's right, moms usually are. So this isn't meant to scare you. You can and you will still find a job that you're happy with, of course. Um, but in my experience, the most important part of your job isn't the work you're doing. So when, after, when I was graduating, when I was in third year, I was like very, very focused on the types of work that different places were doing. And that's kind of how I was trying to make the decision of where to apply to. But a few years into the industry and I've realized that is important, but the most important thing really is the team you work with and the person that you're working directly for. So whether that's a manager, you know, a boss or a creative director, whoever it is. So if you can find a team that's supportive and welcoming and wants you to succeed, 
not only in your current role, but in your career in general, then you have a great job. Like it might not be perfect, but it's pretty great. Um, and it's okay to switch jobs if it's not the right fit. So as, as you know, I've done that a few times and that's fine. So I've been working at the Blondes for about four and a half months now. Um, as Rook just said, they're a small design studio based in Kitchener. Like when I say small, I mean, there's, there's four of us. <laughs> um, <laughs> and obviously the team is all working from home at the moment. Um, since I started working there, I have worked on a huge variety of projects. So <laughs> I've worked on brands, logos, stationery, so letterheads, business cards, envelopes, brand guidelines, annual reports, conference banners, digital campaign materials, postcards, social media, website design, animation, <laughs> among other things. <laughs> So it just gives you an idea of if when you're in a studio, you're going to be working on basically a huge range of things. And the other thing about working at a studio is that they have a diverse range of clients. So that's a fun challenge as well. But um, it, <laughs> it, it's interesting because you could be working on um, something for a client that is, it, you know, they could be like an animal hospital. And in the next day, you could be working on uh, something for a client that they, what they do is they produce pasta, right? So it's like very, very, very different um, audiences and clients. So that, that's fun. Um, I've also, as Rob just said, been teaching part-time at Conestoga College this September, and I'm only a few weeks in. Um, teaching design tech to a second year course. Um, so far, so good. Um, but there's been some lessons for me too, just personally, because you know it's, it's a challenge balancing time, right? Getting work done at the blondes, um, getting prepared for class each week. And that's why I think it's, I'm gonna talk about some time management strategies at the end that I think are gonna be really helpful. So RGD connections. Um, I was a student RGD during the three years of my program. I was mentored by a provisional RGD in my third year, which was really great. She was a grad of the same program um, and she helped soothe my anxiety around placement, uh, finalizing my portfolio and getting ready for our year end show. Then after graduation, I applied to become a provisional RGD. So as Rupesha said, that's the next level after being a student. It was very, very informal. I had a video interview with a, a certified RGD. Um, he's the designer, or he, at least at the time, he was the design director at Vidyard. He was super nice. We went through my portfolio from school. Um, very, very friendly guy. Asked me tons of questions about my work. Um, and then he wanted to hire me when we were done. <laughs> so it went well. <laughs> Um, and then a few months later in the summer, I was invited to join the RGD events committee. And that's where I started my work uh, with committees. So during the pandemic, I've helped the events committee plan and execute several virtual events, such as the last Creative Directions Conference, which was a lot of fun. And I was also extremely fortunate to be men mentored by uh, Diego Lopez, RGD. He's a creative director at Compass Creative in Hamilton. And the reason I applied for an RGD mentor, even after becoming provisional, um, was because I was struggling a bit in my role at my last job. So I mentioned that I had some challenges and he actually helped me create a game plan for some of the issues I was having at work. And he shared tons of resources and his experience as a junior designer. It was just super, super helpful. It made me feel like, you know, I wasn't alone with the struggles that I was having. And I highly recommend RGD's mentorship programs, like even if you don't do it as a student, um, if you are struggling once you get into the workforce, it's a, it's a great way of feeling more comfortable in your role. And then last year, or I'm trying to think, is it last year or the year before, um, I was appointed to the RGD board of directors as one of the provisional representatives. Um, and this was a huge honor. I was super humbled to be asked to join, which it's a very inspiring group of designers. Um, and I'm always blown away by how much work the RGD community and staff and members are doing. Um, the board is made up of all of the chairs of each committee, and it's just fascinating to hear what all the committees are up to and all their goals. 
like Rupcha mentioned, I'm also co-chair of the RGD Provisional Committee. Um, we've divided ourselves into subcommittees and we're working on initiatives and goals specific to provisional RGD member members. And we're hoping that uh, the committee will help provide support to provisional RGDs that are feeling a little out of place after grad and they're still finding their way in the industry. So future design community, um, as part of my continuing contributions to the RGD, I'm really hoping to help new grads entering the workforce with that transition during this very strange time that we find ourselves in, um, which is why I was super happy to talk to you all today. I, and I feel like there's also a need for some support around working from home, although a lot of us are kind of used to that now, um, creating work-life balance while you're working at home, and then you know also pr prioritizing your mental health. So we're all in this together. The RGD community is here to support us. Um, so I'll talk about time management. Woohoo! <laughs> so um, time management, it's, it's a constantly evolving skill that involves things like eff efficiency and avoiding distractions and creating that balance, right? But when you really think about it, time management is just really managing your life. So we all have the same number of hours in the day. Um, the difference is how we choose to use them. If you can start some healthy time slash life management habits now while you're in school, you'll benefit later when you graduate and start working. So the first thing, super obvious, plan ahead. Um, having a plan and knowing everything that it's, is expected of you will save, your, save you time and it's going to make you feel a lot better, right? You're not going to feel like you're going to miss anything. So as a student, the expectations are pretty clear. You're usually aware of everything that's coming up within the entire term at the beginning of the term. So you know what projects you're going to have, you know all the deadlines, you know when your final evaluation is. Um, once you enter the workforce, that kind of changes. So each day or your week might be different. You're ready to be working at the same job with the same people, but what you're working on might change day to day because your priorities actually shift based on client needs. So you could be working on something in the morning, a client emails in the middle of the day, and you just have to switch because something changed and is now priority. And this can be a little jarring at first, um, but most teams have ways of keeping things organized. So I've experienced a lot of different strategies for planning and delegating work at, at my past jobs. None of them are perfect, but um, in general, many design teams will have what they call a production meeting. So they'll either have, I've had teams that do longer ones at the end or the beginning of the week, or I've also done short daily ones like stand-ups. And then during these meetings, the team goes over the list of projects that are currently underway and they check on like the status of things to make sure that things are on schedule and nothing's been forgotten about. So as a designer, it's your responsibility to know what, you, what you're working on, what the deadlines are and what the priorities are for that day of the week. And during those production meetings, you'll find out <laughs> if, those, <laughs> if your plan for the day is correct or if it's gonna change. So the other thing that I would recommend is time tracking. So this is something that is at first really weird, but if you can do it and make it a habit and make it second nature, it's super helpful because this is something that you will be expected to do most likely when you start work. Um, so just try to be diligent about it. Try to track the actual time spent on your projects. So pay attention to when you're taking breaks or, you know, when your mind wanders off. <laughs> um, keep the records in a notebook or an Excel sheet, or there's lots of free apps you can use. And if you want to make it slightly more complex, you can break it down into categories that reflect the design process. So like research or concepts, et cetera. And you'll find, at least I did, once you start tracking your time, you'll find yourself more accountable about the time that you're setting aside as dedicated work time, because you'll start realizing how much time you take for a break, 
how much time you, you know, get sidetracked on Instagram, whatever it is. Um, I started time tracking my work when I was in second year. It was actually a requirement in school. Um, and it was really annoying at first, I'll admit. But once you start doing it, it becomes second nature, as I said. But it's really, really interesting to see how much time you spend on certain stages of the design process and how long some projects take versus others. So the reason that I say this is like I said, many design jobs require their designers to track their time. Not all, but all of the ones that I've had so far do. The reason for this is that agencies and studios have project budgets based on the estimated hours that a job should take. And when you're assigned a project or part of one, you most likely will be told how much time you have for it. And it's up to you to divvy the time up into the different stages of the project and make sure you don't go over hours. The other thing that saves a lot of time is being super organized. Um, so you have more time for other things other than work, sleeping, Netflix, playing with your dog, whatever it is. I've been, I've always been a really organized person, but I found, you know, especially in school and now in work, um, the skills that I had before make me a successful designer and a team member. So I, I'm going to go over a couple of things I do to stay organized. Some of these things you might already be doing. Some of these things you may never have thought about. So I use a bullet journal. Um, it does not look like this. This is a picture that I found. Mine does not look that pretty. Um, so using a bullet journal or like any kind of daily planner to track your to do's and your monthly important dates. Every morning I go through my email and my calendar and make sure I don't miss anything. And then at the beginning of each month, I do like a monthly spread so I can see the month at a glance. Um, if you're interested in doing a uh, starting or doing a bullet journal, there's tons of resources online. Um, I watched a five minute video to get started and that's all that I needed. <clears throat> and another really important thing is folder in file organization. Not sexy at all, <laughs> but it saves you loads of time if your files are organized. So I didn't know how to, I didn't learn or know how to properly organize files until I had my first studio job at Studio Locale. And now I use a similar method for everything. So I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty, um, but I did present, I did a, a Skillshare presentation um, with the RGD back in August. And I think students have access to that, Hillary, is that correct? Yes, yes? they all have access to the members only section where all the videos are. Awesome. So you can find it there. Um, it's like 10, 15 minutes long. I go through my entire process for file naming and organization. Um, and I think you'll find it useful. I, if I had started that in school, it would have saved me loads of time in school. <laughs> so the other thing is keeping everything. So I mean, like keeping your files. And now that you know how to organize it and find it after you watch that webinar. <laughs> um, you can reuse things and save yourself time. So things like project presentations or layouts for things that come up all the time, like brand guidelines or newsletters. Basically, you're creating your own templates that have you, so you have a base design to start from. Like obviously you can change the styles, mix it up, but you know, you just having a document set up that you can use as a starting base is going to save you probably at least an hour of your time. Second thing, or last thing I should say, is taking notes. Um, so yeah, it, it seems really obvious again, but I find I have to write things down to remember them. And then when you're listening to your client or your instructor, whoever it is that's giving feedback, they usually won't pause right so like write it down jot down some notes you might think you're going to remember it all you definitely won't <laughs> and if you're in a you know if you're in a video call and your head's down and you're writing notes like you know you might just have to say sorry i'm just writing this down they're going to be super impressed that, that you're taking such lengths for in respect for their thoughts and their ideas and that you're making sure you're covering everything they're saying so it is a sign of respect so I will leave you with this. Uh, I love this poster. It's Anthony Brill, uh, work hard and be nice to people. 
build a good reputation, both as a designer and as a person. The design community is super small. If you're an amazing designer, but not a nice person to work with, you're not gonna get very far. So that's it. Thanks for listening. Um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. If you have any questions, you can follow me on Instagram. I rarely post, but it's there. <laughs> Stay in current. <laughs>
And the whole point of that was for them basically to ask me questions about working there. So you might also have that opportunity, which is great. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Good question. You're welcome. Jenna has her hand up. Yeah. Hi. I also had a question about the time tracking. Yeah. And I just started doing it and noticed I take longer than expected. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a little bit of embarrassment around how long it takes me and being honest that it takes me this long. Right. So how do you navigate saying, hey, I actually need more time to execute this? Yeah, it's it's one of those things, like, especially as a junior designer, I think a lot of workplaces are expecting you to, to be not, not slow, but you're, you're not going to be as quick as like a senior designer that's been working there for five years, right? It's just, it's, it's impossible. So a lot of workplaces will already have that in mind. But if you're, if you're using an app like on Harvest, when I get assigned a project, I can log on to Harvest and see exactly how many hours are allocated for the entire thing. And sometimes that's not my time either, right? There's like, sometimes there's design time plus other time for other things. So I like to keep an eye on it. And if it's getting to the point where I'm like, crap, like I'm, I'm gonna go over, like I don't have enough time. That's when you talk to your manager or your creative director, whoever you're directly reporting to and just be honest, right? Just say like, I'm, I'm, I have a feeling I'm gonna go over this, especially if it's things like in the earlier you can do that, the better. Because sometimes it's things that are are caused by the client. So it could be things like the assets they supplied you with, right? Like the images or whatever it is. Maybe they're like not in good shape. They need a lot of Photoshop work. And we didn't know that that was needed. So that's something that, that they would need to know, right? That there's extra work that wasn't accounted for. So they will actually be very happy to hear that you know, you've discovered this thing that is going to impact the project and they'd rather find it out about that sooner rather than later. So projects go over budget. It happens for a variety of reasons. So I would just say communicate with whoever is, you know, your direct um, management person and just let them know. I wouldn't be embarrassed about it. It happens. <laughs> yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And like, while you're learning, you're going to be slower, right? And you get faster with time. It happens without you even realizing. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Pantea, am I saying that right? Or Pantea? Yeah, it's Fanta, but don't worry about it. That's hard to pronounce. <laughs> I have a yeah. complicated name too, but you had your yeah, uh, so I actually am struggling with something at the moment, and mm -hmm. I don't know if you had this issue as well when you were a student or not, but I feel like, um, so I'm trying to like do something extracurricular for myself, like right. I want to do something for my own portfolio, maybe besides the schoolwork, because I feel like a lot of the schoolwork is like assignments that are not very useful for your portfolio, maybe sometimes. Okay. Um, so do you have any like tips? I don't know, how can I find time in my day to actually work on something for myself because I feel like when I say like two hours for this every day a lot of times because I have school stuff I skip it and do something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how do you actually um I don't know do it I think probably if I was trying to do something outside of work and everything else I would probably start with small chunks of time so instead of saying okay I'm going to devote two hours to this maybe start with like half an hour and then see if you can you can devote just half an hour and then maybe it will grow right as time goes on. Um, what I did for a little while when I was trying to do extra stuff I had some freelance work I was working on I was getting up uh, very early in the morning. <laughs> so I was uh, getting up at like five five thirty and working from like six to eight and then starting my other job at 830 I wouldn't recommend doing that for long periods of time. <laughs> But that is another way you can do it is um, carving out time outside of your regular schedule. But that means also that you want to make sure you're going to bed at a decent time so you're still <laughs> getting enough sleep. But I would start with like a smaller goal, right? So like maybe it's just half an hour um, and maybe you can do it on a weekend or maybe a day where you don't have as much pressure. If you have a day where you don't have class, that might be a good way to start. 
Yeah, it's very interesting. That's actually what I do too. I wake up at five and I work till like seven for myself. If I can yeah. actually sleep early the, day, uh, the night before. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I find that it's uh, pretty practical compared to other things that I've tried. But yeah, I guess maybe I have to reduce the amount of time I spend on it though. Yeah, it depends on, you know, that works for me because I'm, I'm more of a morning person, someone who's a night owl, you know, maybe they'll yeah. carve out time in the evenings, right? Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, no problem. Roxanne, I believe you had your hand up too. I did, but my question got answered. It was pertaining to about um, if you do find that you have are taking a lot of time for projects that shouldn't be taking as long, just mm -hmm. how can you cut down your time without cutting um, corners or um, like losing quality of work? But mm -hmm. I believe you mentioned it happens over time. You just yeah. You get you get faster over time. The 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 one thing that I found was useful with that was um, I mentioned if you want to make your time tracking slightly more complex um, when you're working, say you're working on an assignment or a project, if you can track the type of thing you're doing for that. So you know the different categories of the design process. So usually you start with your research, then you move on to your concepts, then you move on to your creative development. If you can track the time, depending on what it is that you're doing, you'll start to see where you're spending the most time. So for me, <laughs> I know I spend way too much time in the research phase and the concept phase. I, that's just something that I struggle with personally. So I, I waste time at the beginning of the project that I should be like shaving off so that I have more time at the end. So that's, <laughs> that's one way that you can do it is you realize like, oh, I spend a lot of time on concepts. So maybe instead of coming up with quite so many, I could try to do less and spend less time on that part of the project. But I wouldn't put too, too much pressure on yourselves like at this point in your career because you're still learning. It's things just take a little bit longer and just try to have patience with yourself. <laughs> it's not an easy thing. Yeah, absolutely. It just gets hard when you're just like, oh my gosh, I have this project and then <laughs> project and you're like, it's yeah. been three hours. What am I doing? Yeah. And it's like, you get almost like that, you know, writer's block, but for designers, right? Like creative block where you're just staring at this artboard and you don't know what to do. And I find if that's the case where you're just stuck, just move on to something else, go to bed, whatever it is. And then either look at it with fresh eyes the next day or have someone else look at it ask for help right so whether that's an instructor or like you know one of your peers and there could just be like a little thing that they say that just nudges you in the right direction and then you're not stuck anymore yeah that makes a lot of sense thank you so yeah. much yeah no problem that's something that i had to learn once i started working because once you're working with a budget and you don't want to be wasting time just staring at your computer right so you have to learn to just stop where you are you know save the pdf take a screenshot whatever it is send it to someone get feedback before you move on because getting stuck is a very, very real thing no absolutely <laughs> i think we have time for maybe one more question and i'm actually going to give it to michaela because she hasn't had a chance to ask a question yet but you guys can always email carrie or uh hit her up on linkedin yeah um for sure and she answer all your questions yeah <laughs> also on slack yes <laughs> we'll get everyone added to slack today anyway Perfect. i'll let uh michaela ask her question yep um my question is just about your undergraduate degree so I also have an undergrad in sociology, and I'm just wondering how your previous schooling has helped you with your current uh, graphic design career. Hmm. So this took me a long time to realize because um, <laughs> when I did my undergraduate degree, I just it didn't really move on. Like I moved on from it, but I didn't immediately leap into something. I thought, oh, this is just a waste of time. It totally wasn't. So I found the note taking, the paying attention, sitting in lecture, because I did that for hours and hours on end. Um, that helped me immensely. Um, the other funny thing, 
that it helped me with. I don't know if you guys have tests that you need to take in any of your courses, but I had a design history uh, class in first year and we had multiple choice tests. Me that too. also many of your courses, but I had it design history. So that uh, there was multiple choice tests for that. So that helped immensely. Um, but I, I would say the biggest impact that it had was the, the research. So kind of just being comfortable with asking questions, knowing where to go, knowing where to find resources, being familiar with going to the library and looking at different things. Um, that was definitely helpful. So it's it, like I said, it took me a while to kind of like bridge the gap because it is very different. Um, but there's a lot of skills that are transferable for sure. But we can talk more about that later if you want to kind of compare experiences. Um, Pantea, I think we can squeeze in your question. We, we have until 8.45, so we're a little, we're actually ahead of time today, which is great. <laughs> Hopefully it wasn't um, because I was talking too fast. <laughs> no, you did great. Um, thank you for um, putting that together. I think it was really helpful. But anyways, Pantea, oh, awesome. sorry for butchering your name again. Oh, sorry. That was for the previous question. I forgot to bring it down. Put your hand down. <laughs> <laughs> all good well <laughs> then i guess last call for any questions for carrie yeah before we let her go okay well thank you carrie for coming to speak to us today it was so really welcome great. Um, we will be linking Carrie's LinkedIn and her Instagram in the minute, so you can get in touch with her if you need to. Um, you can message her on Slack, uh, any other ways they can get in contact with you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and if there's any further like follow-up things or if you want to chat about, you know, like Michaela was asking about doing an undergrad and I'll give it some more thought and we can talk about it later, definitely. All right, well, enjoy the rest of your meeting. Thanks, Carrie. You're Thank so you welcome. Too, it was so nice chatting Thank with you, you all. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. You're Thank so you welcome. So Thank welcome. You.